Good morning, church. How is everyone? Great day to praise the Lord. Amen. Let's stand and, and worship our King. I was buried in me, my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my turn till I met you. I was breathing, but not. All my failures I try to hide It was my tomb Till I met you Here we go, church You called my name And I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness Into your glorious day you called my name, and I ran out of that grave, out of the darkness, into your glorious day. Now your mercy, now your mercy has saved my soul. Freedom is all that I know. The old made new. Jesus, when I met you, you called my name and I ran out of that grave. Out of the darkness into your glorious day. You called my name, and I ran out of that grave, out of the darkness, into your glorious day. I needed rescue. I needed rescue. My sin was heavy, and chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter, I was an orphan, now you called me a citizen of heaven. Up, church. When I was broken, you were my healing, now your love is the air that I'm breathing. I have a future, my eyes are open, and when you called my name, and I ran out of that grave, out of Praise our Father in heaven. Let praise be a weapon, a weapon that silences the enemy. Amen. He has no reign over us, thanks to Jesus. Praise be a weapon that silences the enemy. Let praise be a weapon that conquers all anxiety. Let it rise. Let praise arise. We've seen your name in the dark and it changes everything. We sing with all we are and we claim your victory. Let it rise, let praise arise. We'll see you break down every wall. We'll watch the giants fall, for fear can 
down the burdens that we have. We long to lay down any anxiety that we have within us and rest it at the foot of the cross where it has all been paid by your son Jesus Christ. And in that longing, in that laying down, we want to lift up his name in praise. For it's been accomplished, and we are grateful and we are thankful that we have your word and we can be assured daily that you're working in our lives, that you have a will for us, that you will move us forward in ways that are all for our good, whether we're on a hilltop, whether we're in a valley. We love you, Lord, and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Carried a burden too long on my own. I wasn't created to bear it alone. Hear your invitation to let it all go. I see it now, I'm laying it down, and I know that I need you. I run to the Father, I fall into grace, I'm done with 
the hiding, no reason to wait. My heart needs a surgeon, my soul needs its friend. So I'll run to the Father again and again and again and again. Oh, oh, oh. You saw my condition and a plan from the start. Your son for redemption, the, the price for my heart. Amen. I don't have a context for that kind of love. I don't understand. I can't comprehend. All I Surging, my soul needs a friend, so I'll run to the Father again and again and again and again. Oh, 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 oh. again and again. Run to the Father. I run to the Father. I fall in the grace. I'm done with the hiding. No reason to wait. My heart found a surgeon. My soul found a friend. So I run to the Father again and again and again and again. God is with us, amen, and he is peace, and this next song says, in the chorus, I just want to read the chorus for you, as we head into the season of Advent, Jesus is our deliverer, he's our savior, in his presence we find strength, amen, over everything, our redemption, God with us. God is with us.
be nearer to us so you've come to bring light to be light to shine brighter in us so we Father God, you are with us, and we proclaim that with everything that we are down deep. For your son Jesus Christ came, and he is our living hope, and he's now, through the resurrection, all of our hope, and as we look to the future, he is our hope. We love you, Lord Jesus, amen. The church, just stay on that for a second. And I think the one thing I was thinking about this morning as I was getting ready and getting things going was there's so many times in my life where I let the chaos of the world come in and just freak me out. And I was brought back to many times where Jesus just kind of went, shh, calm the storm, shh, calm the water. And I think that's where we are today. You know, we're in the Christmas season, which is great. But sometimes that brings even more hectic stuff. And just listen to God in those times and just take a second and just go, shh, and let him calm the storm in your life. I think it's super important in these times that we just let that happen. 
Father, we just thank you for this day. We thank you for this time together. And we pray that you bless everyone that's here. Bless those who are traveling today, Lord. Just give them mercies. In your name, amen. Well, good morning, church. Good morning, church. Yeah, that's, that's way better. Okay, so a couple things. Um, I'm Sam, and I, I have the great opportunity to be part of the leadership and pastoral team here at, at uh, I almost said South Pierce, that's where I work, here at Living Water. And uh, so now that you know who I am, take a minute and get to know who, who each other is next door. Say hi to each other. All right, find your way back to your seats. I almost hate to break that up. You guys get to see each other and talk so much. Let's wake our way back to the seats. Hey, speaking of seats, in the seat back pocket is a Connect card. They're green. And on the front, it has a couple of things, information about you. If you're new here, we'd like to get to know you, and this is how we do it. You flip it over on the back side, and there are prayer requests. And these are really important. The, the, the entire team prays over these prayer requests. Every week, Brian's very faithful to collect them all, get them all out to us, and we have the opportunity to pray over these. Don't forget to put your praises on those too because we like that too. Um, offering, come on up. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to give to you, Lord, and I pray that you would bless the gifts and the givers. In your name, amen. Well, there's a lot of buzz. Merry Christmas, by the way. Wait. Merry Christmas, by the way. Yeah, only a foundation on what our face built on. No big deal. So I'm just excited for the Christmas season and, and the buzz that's out there. It's, you know, I went shopping yesterday, which was nuts. Um, I, I don't go out on Black Friday, but I went on Saturday. So I, it wasn't any better, by the way. So, all right. Um, so there's some things going on. Men's 33. I'm your slide, by the way. I'm your slide. Men's 33 is not this Thursday. But the next Thursday, and you get an opportunity to sign up, and I've already got the books ordered, and I did it in faith, so that means that if you guys don't get it, then I don't know what to do with the books. But you guys need to sign up for that. Get out there. Get your name on there. Make sure that you put your, your phone number and your email address on the sign-in sheet. The women's have a ladies' dinner coming up, and uh, it's got to come up because I missed the date. There we go. Um, if that's on December 6th at 6 p.m. right here. $5 a person. They'll be signed up to the connect table as well next to the men's stuff. All right. And so let's see. We've got some interesting stuff going on. Christmas is on Sunday this year. So we are not going to have church on Sunday, but we are going to have a Christmas Eve service. And that Christmas Eve service will be right here at 4 p.m. And we're going to get the seats all nice and tight. And it's going to be an amazing time together. But just remember Christmas Day there's no service Christmas Day. Christmas Eve, bring yourself, bring your families. We'll, we'll have this thing packed out, which will be amazing. So, and with that. Thank you, Sam. Would you thank Sam with me? <laughs> Merry Christmas. This is the first Sunday of Advent. Can you hear me? Am I on? Am I on? Wait, how about now? There we go. This is our first Sunday of Advent, and I'm, I'm standing up here on the floor next to an Advent wreath, and I want to just share a little bit about Advent. It might be a new tradition for you. It's something that Susie and I have, have celebrated for many years. If I haven't met you yet, I'm Bob Horn. I'm the pastor here at this amazing church called Living Water Yelm. 
And Advent was a tradition that I think as you look back at history, it was around the fourth century that Advent, this, this celebration of Advent basically kind of appeared on the scene. It was, it was designed as a time of preparation for new believers as they got ready to be baptized in the new year at Epiphany. And it was expanded to include a time of preparation for the entire Christmas season. So for the early Christians, Advent was focused not just on the first coming of Christ, Christmas, but also on the second coming of Christ, his return that we look forward to. And so the Advent season, the first couple of weeks were really focused on the second coming of Christ and preparing for Jesus' return. And then the, then the following two weeks, the last two weeks of Advent were focused on Christmas. So the two comings of Christ were, were joined together at the celebration of Advent always linked. The participation in Advent, it would include a wreath like you see here, and the wreath symbolizes that circle, that, that eternity, that, uh, the, the eternal quality of Jesus, that Christ is eternal and without end. And then there would be four candles. I've got four red candles here, and there'll be a, a white candle that we'll place here Christmas Eve. And those four candles represented uh, represented the prophecy candle, the Bethlehem candle, the shepherd's candle, and the angel's candle, and then the center white candle is the Jesus candle. So each Sunday this month, we're going to have a different family or individuals come and share a reading, share a scripture, and light each one of our candles. So this morning, I'm going to invite up the Garcia family, and they're going to light the first candle of Advent with us. Would you welcome them as they come? Good morning and happy first Sunday of Advent. We're so happy to be here with you. My name is Christina Garcia. This is my husband, Pedro. This is my father, Ken, my daughter, Elisa, and our adopted daughter, so to speak, Alicia. The first candle of Advent is a shining light in anticipation of the coming of Christ. It is called the prophecy candle. It represents the promises of God for our long-awaited Messiah. From the book of Isaiah, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and it will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness. From that time on and forever, the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. As we light the prosperity candle, we think about God's promises. Each promise fills us with hope. The Bible is full of promises. In the Old Testament, God promised his people a savior. They waited for Jesus who would save us and reign forever as king. In the New Testament, Jesus promised us that he would return. Christians all over the world look forward to that day. Today, we also have promises from God for our lives. He knows our future, and we can have hope in him. God is always good, and God will always keep his promises. Let's pray. Jesus, you are Emmanuel, God with us. We celebrate that you have fulfilled the prophecy, the promise. You came all those years ago, providing us with unending hope. On this first week of Advent, we set aside time to anticipate the coming of Christmas. In our lives, may we choose hope. In our doubts, 
may we walk in faith. In our actions, may we obey. In our waiting, may we remember your goodness. And if we lack any of these, may we rely on your strength. Thank you for being the constant source of our hope. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Garcia family. Appreciate that. That was beautiful. Thanks, Shelly. It was July 2012, and uh, I was backpacking with two other gentlemen and nine Boy Scouts, including my son Kyle, and it was the first morning of a, of a 10-day, 80-mile backpacking trip in the rugged backcountry of Philmont Scout Ranch in Cimarron, New Mexico. We woke up hours before dawn, like at a time that nobody really should be awake. <laughs> and uh, this, this young scouter who was part of the camp staff was assigned to our group for the first few days. He got us up really early. He was our, our ranger and got us up on the trail and, uh, and had us hiking in the dark, complete darkness other than just our, our headlamps. And our trail guide, he's... He's keeping our pace up like we got a bus to catch. Like, come on, let's go, come on, keep going. And we're like, what, what is going on? Why are, we, why are we up in the dark hiking? And as we're hiking, I'm like, these questions are forming in my mind. Like, where are we going? How long is this hike in the dark? What, how, what, what, is there a point to this little crazy nighttime excursion? So we're stumbling over roots and rocks as we're hiking, because you can't see anything. Those little headlamps don't illuminate. You can see the back of the guy's head in front of you. That's about it. <laughs> so we're stumbling over rocks. We're stumbling over roots. We're bumping into the hiker in front, the, stumbling into the guy behind you. And finally, we get to our, our trail guide, our, our ranger's intended destination. And there's this like huge like rock outcropping over this deep valley. You can barely make it out in kind of the, the darkness, the, the moonlight. And he sits us down on this rock outcropping, and, and it, we're facing due east. So all 13 of us are just sitting on this rock outcropping, just staring out into this nighttime, kind of making out like, like this is a precipitous fall that we're on right here on this outcropping he's got us sitting on. Like you just, we're like, boys, stay back, you know, but he has us sitting there. We just kind of all gaze out into the dark. It's completely quiet. The cold of the night's beginning to settle in. We're like, what's going on? And then, of course, we, we see this sliver of light over the horizon just beginning to, to break. As we just sat there and, and stared into the, the night sky, we continued to study it as the light of dawn pierced the darkness and we saw the sunrise. And the, the coldness of night just gave way to the, the warmth of the sun. And it was in that moment that hope just washed over our crew. of Nine scouts and three leaders and, and this 19-year-old ranger that brought us here to this moment. Because we knew what was ahead for us. We had a grueling hike ahead. We would be carrying 40-plus pounds of gear on our backs with at least three days of food and water at a time. And at one point, we'd be hiking over a 12,000-foot mountain with all of that. We knew it would be challenging. Um, have you ever had teenage boys navigate with a map and a compass in the wilderness? It's nuts. <laughs> we got lost several times. <laughs> but we... In this moment, we were filled with this confident expectation. We knew that we were in for an experience that we weren't going to forget. And then we celebrated with cake. No lie, this ranger, he reaches into his backpack, and he, he had carried, I don't know how he did it, but he had carried with, with him a full-size cake. 
he pulls out this cake and a canister of frosting, and all the boys are like, what cake? And now he had forgotten the forks or any kind of spoon or knife to spread it with. So the boys are like just grabbing handfuls of cake and reaching in and grabbing frosting and just going to town on this cake, just celebrating this moment. We watched the sunrise, we ate cake, and we looked forward to the adventure ahead. It was amazing. More than 700 years before Jesus' birth, the prophet Isaiah penned these words that you heard moments ago from the Garcias. Isaiah 9, verse 2. The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. For those who live in a land of deep darkness, a light will shine. Isaiah was prophesying about the nations, the nation Israel's promised Messiah, the hope of Israel, and ultimately the hope of a world walking in darkness. He continues on in verses 6 and 7. Isaiah writes, For a child is born to us, a son is given to us. The government will rest on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His government and its peace will never end. He will rule with fairness and justice from the throne of his ancestor David for all eternity. The passionate commitment of the Lord of Heaven's armies will make this happen. Two chapters earlier, Isaiah, he embeds a future promise within a prophecy to the nation Israel. In Isaiah 7, 14, he writes, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. Emmanuel means God with us. Flash forward about 730 years. The nation of Israel is under Roman occupation. Herod the Great is the tyrannical king of Judea and a vassal of the Roman Empire. It's been 400 years since God, Yahweh, has spoken to Israel. There's been no prophecies, no scripture, just silence. And those years have blinded and deafened the nation to the point where most Jews could not even consider the concept of a humble Messiah It's a world of darkness, of silence, of hopelessness, and it's in the midst of this silent darkness that hope is about to be born. Have you experienced hopelessness? That feeling of sitting in the cold, inky darkness, staring into some figurative horizon, waiting for dawn to break, waiting for the light of day, stealing yourself for like a new normal of living under a canopy of gray dreariness. Not, not getting your hopes up and setting your expectations low. Anticipating disappointment and then, and then finding a sick satisfaction when it comes as if to say, I told you. What if I told you that Christmas, the advent of Messiah, The arrival of Emmanuel, God with us, the coming of Jesus, is the very definition of hope and the antidote to not just your hopelessness, but the remedy for a world without hope. Would you be willing this morning to explore that possibility? Let's pray. God, thank you that in a world of hopelessness, you, Jesus, are our hope. This morning, as we talk about hope, May it not just be talk, but may we experience hope. May we have an encounter with the God of all hope. May we understand, Jesus, that you are our hope. So as we open your word, we ask, Jesus, that you would reveal your character and nature. You would remind us who we are, because this world of hopelessness, it's really easy to forget who you have told us we are. We want to know you, Jesus. We want to understand you, but most of all, we want to encounter you. And I pray that your word would be a lamp to our feet, a light to our path, and that the light of your word would break through the dark hopelessness that so many of us experience. We ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. What is hope? So it's in this like flurry of Christmas magic that we 
we kind of lose sight of what hope means. We, we think of it as a wish, as something that we would just add to a holiday list of wants. We say things like, and we, we use it as a synonym for wish or desire or anticipate. We say things like, I hope Santa brings me a Nintendo Switch. I hope Andrew doesn't bring that new girlfriend to Christmas dinner. I hope I can get Christmas Eve off. I hope this Christmas will be different. And Bible, the Bible doesn't define or express hope like that. Hope has an entirely different meaning in Scripture. Let's dig into a few of these words. I want to do a little bit of a word study with you and talk about what hope is in Scripture. In the Old Testament, one Hebrew verb often translated hope is kawa. And if there's any Hebrew scholars in here, I know I'm butchering the Hebrew words, but forgive me. So, the Hebrew scholars, anyone? Okay, good, I'm off the hook. Uh, kawa, and it means to wait or to look for with eager expectation. And there's a second Hebrew verb, yachal. It refers to waiting, and it has the effect of making or causing someone to hope. It conveys the idea of confident expectation and trust. And you see it in verses like Psalm 31, 24. Be strong and take heart, all you who hope in the Lord. In the Old Testament, hope is grounded in God and is both the trusting attitude in his active but provisional deliverance and the confident expectation in God's ultimate deliverance. Isaiah speaks of this kind of hope in Isaiah 25, 9. And I put the words in here so you could see it. So he says, look, this is our God. We have waited, kawa, for him, and he saved us. This is Yahweh. We waited, kawa, for him. Let us be glad and let us rejoice in his salvation. The prophet Micah uses the other word, Micah 7, 7. He says, but as for me, I will look to Yahweh. I will wait, yakal for the God of my salvation. So the people of the Old Testament were hoping for a coming Messiah. God had promised David, Israel's greatest king, that he would raise up one of his descendants to establish his kingdom and the throne of his kingdom forever. And the anointed ruler, Messiah, would be God's agent to restore Israel's glory and rule the nations in peace and righteousness. Most of King David's descendants, though, were... They were wrecks. They were like extreme disappointments. And so Israel just kind of gave up. They continued to hope for a son of David who would fulfill God's promise, but so far they, they had not seen anybody that came close. Hope isn't a hesitant wish that God would be or could be faithful and true. It's the confident expectation that he cannot be anything but faithful and true, and he will do what he has said he will do. So in the midst of hopelessness, what I want to do this morning is give you a new definition of hope. It isn't a flimsy wish. The biblical definition of hope is waiting with eager, confident expectation and trust in God. That's what hope is. So if that's the definition, where can I place my hope? I place my hope in all the wrong things. I don't know if you do this. I place my hope in my own abilities. When money is tight and my wife says to me, we need to have a budget committee meeting and look at, look at our finances, I just go, oh, don't worry. I'm an entrepreneur. I can make some more money. It, this is no problem. We'll just, I'll trust in my abilities. Or I'll trust in my friends. I'll put my hope in my friends, which doesn't sound like a bad thing, right? To put hope in other people. But when I put my hope in my friends, I'm not putting my hope in God I turn to my friends and I complain and I moan and I share my misery with them in hopes that they'll make me feel better. Or I put my hope in my family. When I'm disappointed, I hope that my family will make better choices so that I'll feel better. When I put my hope in my family, I know nobody in the room has ever done that. Put my hope in my spouse, my wife, or maybe you have a significant other. You put your hope in your spouse or significant other. If you've been married or dating for 30 minutes, your spouse or your significant other has disappointed you. (laughs) And if that isn't true, you have disappointed them. (laughs) Just saying. I put my hope in my work. I don't know if you know this, but my work is this. So if I put my hope in my work, 
I'm putting all my hopes and dreams on this room full of people that you would make me feel better about myself. Is that sick or what? <laughs> I love you, but you are not responsible for my, my hopes and dreams. I put my hope in my accomplishments. I got a master's degree a bunch of years ago. I put my hope in that if I get my education on track, that that's, that'll be my hope. Or I could put my hope in my physical abilities, my physical accomplishments. I've run a bunch of marathons. I did a half Ironman a few years ago. I could think, oh, I just need to have the next thing to do. I'll put my hope in my, my physical abilities. I'm 53. There's less hope to be attained by putting it in my physical abilities. <laughs> or financial, you know, wanting to build a business and thinking maybe if I, just, if I just did this thing with my business, maybe it would take off and I could put my hope there. I put my hope in my possessions. We have a beautiful home here in Yelm. I could put my hope in that, but if, if I just have the right house, make this place really beautiful, that's where I could put my hope. My toys, my possessions, my, my, uh, my truck, if I could get my truck fixed, then I could really enjoy life. Could put my hope in my yard, just had it landscaped and excited about you coming over and sitting in my backyard when the rain stops, that'll be about June 20th, um, and enjoy our landscaped backyard, have a nice bonfire, put my hope there. I could put my hope in having a pet. I still want a dog. Don't think my wife is ever going to let me have a dog. <laughs> I watch the dog show on Thanksgiving Day. I do it every year. I get so excited for the Vishla, but the Vishla never gets a showing. It's always some other fancy, fancy named dog, but, you know, I want a dog. I can put my hope in my entertainment, you know, having, going to a, getting invited to a party or concert or vacation. Ah, next summer, that's where my hope is when we finally get to go on vacation. You know what? They all come up short. They all disappoint me. But I found an answer in Paul's letter to the Romans. Romans 5, 5. This is the amplified version. Such hope in God's promises never disappoints us because God's love has been abundantly poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. You and I can place our hope in God's promises, in his character, in his incredible love for us. We'll never be disappointed there. At the end of Isaiah 49, 23, God says so. He says, then you will know that I am the Lord. Those who hope in me will not be disappointed. I was writing this message on Friday, day after Thanksgiving, and I woke up and, you know, I, I, I had intended to get it started earlier in the week, but, you know, with Thanksgiving and everything, it just, it wound up Friday was going to be my day to, to write this message. And I woke up, and I'll be honest, I did not feel like writing a message about hope on Friday morning. <laughs> Thanksgiving was good, but it didn't start out the way that uh, we hoped it would. My wife and I, we were excited about hosting Thanksgiving in our house here in Yelm, new house, and inviting all my extended family to come to town and be with us. And one person in our family had a fever, and so that had a ripple effect that all the people that were coming weren't coming. And uh, we pivoted. We got to have Thanksgiving with, with uh, our son-in-law's family, and it was beautiful. It really was a really great time, but I was bummed because it wasn't what I had hoped for. So I woke up Friday, and I was like, I don't know, just kind of like not, not hopeful. And I wasn't depressed, but... I had the shovel, and I was starting to dig the hole. Do you know what I mean? You ever been there? Where you're like, yeah, life sucks. <laughs> it's really bad. <laughs> and I'm just like digging with my little hopelessness shovel, <clears throat> digging this hole. I don't know whatever I was going to go with it, but I just thought, wait a minute. And that's when Psalm 42.5 came to my mind. Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. I want you to know this isn't a directive to stuff your feelings and just smile and hope in God. It's an invitation to dig into what you're feeling. It's an invitation for you to say, 
What am I sad about? What am I angry about? What am I anxious about? And then to ask why I'm downcast and disturbed, and then to allow God to come into those feelings. It doesn't mean you just stuff and ignore those feelings. It means you, you sit in them, you look, what am I feeling? Identify it. So often we go through life not knowing what the heck we're feeling. But digging into it and go, well, what am I sad about? What am I angry about? What am I anxious about? What am I glad about? Explore that and then invite Jesus into those feelings with you. Why am I so downcast? Put your hope in God. Asking God to enter those feelings, meet me there as I put my hope in the one who will never disappoint me. If I can place my hope in God's promises and he never disappoints, then what has he promised and how do I know it's true? In a word, our hope is Jesus. It's Jesus. Why is Jesus our hope? All right, you're going to see probably hundreds of manger scenes this Christmas, right? You see them everywhere. And for most of society, that's their picture of Jesus. Little tiny infant baby Jesus, eight and a half pound Jesus. Will Ferrell played this fantastic character in Talladega Nights, The Ballad of Ricky Bobby. Raise your hand, admit it. Those of you that have seen it, okay, if you haven't, well, I didn't recommend it to you, but (laughs) he plays a race car driver who starts out dinner grace with, dear Lord, baby Jesus, and his wife cuts him off. He says, um, you know, sweetie, Jesus did grow up. You don't always have to call him baby. It's a little off-putting to pray to a baby. And then Ricky, he has his comeback. He says, well, look, I like the Christmas Jesus best when I'm saying grace. When you say grace, you can say it to grown-up Jesus or teenage Jesus or bearded Jesus or whoever you want. He just liked to pray to tiny baby Jesus. (laughs) Jesus did grow up. He's the Messiah who brought salvation by his life, death, and resurrection, and all of God's promises are fulfilled in him. 1 Corinthians 1.20 says, For no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. And so through him, the amen is spoken to us by the glory of God. It's through Jesus that God has reconciled us to himself. We were born into this world with a pre-existing condition called sin. It's this condition that makes us rebel against our creator, serve our own needs first, and look to artificial sources for love and comfort. And Jesus took our sin upon himself on that cross. He died in our place. He rose again, and he defeated our three enemies, death, sin, and Satan. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 to 19 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone, the new is here. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ not counting people's sins against them, and he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. At Christmas, we're going to celebrate Jesus' arrival on planet Earth 2,000 years ago to a world walking in darkness, his first arrival. And just like me and those other scouts sitting in the cold darkness on the mountainside waiting for dawn's early light, it's at Christ's birth that the world was awakened by hope. But the Christmas story isn't only about hope coming into the world 2,000 years ago. Christmas reminds us that Jesus fulfilled the hope of the world and fills us with hope for the world to come. It was right after Jesus' resurrection when he ascended into heaven. All the disciples, you can picture this, the disciples are on the Mount of Olives. They have just watched Jesus ascend into heaven, go into the clouds, what would you be doing? You'd be standing there just like them, like going mouth wide open, staring up into the clouds. And then these two angels show up and they say to them, this is Acts 1, 10 and 11, says they were looking intently up into the sky as he was going when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven? He will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. 
Jesus is our hope because he's coming once again to a world walking in darkness. There's another place where I wrongly put my hope. It's my desire for the world to get better. There are days when all I see is the darkness, the despair, and the brokenness. That's all I see. And I just want God to fix everything and make it all better. And I have good news. He will. God's promised to do just that. Jesus is going to come again. We're going to see light bursting forth from the east, illuminating the whole sky. Jesus is going to stand on the Mount of Olives, and he won't come as a humbling, suffering servant, a Messiah. He's going to come as our king. And when we see that sunrise, there's going to be more than cake to celebrate. (laughs) Revelation 21, 1 to 5 talks about what God's going to do. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying, or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who is seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. Jesus is coming back. He's going to set up his throne forever, just as God promised to King David. There'll be no more death, or mourning, or crying, or pain, Every tear of hopelessness will be wiped away. Everything you see and experience that's dark, despairing, or broken will be made new. This hope of Jesus' return is what Titus calls the blessed hope. Titus 2, 11 to 13, For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the God the peering of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Does that get you excited? Here's the reality. Right now, you might be stumbling over roots and rocks and feeling your way through the cold, dark night, uncertain where you're headed and no idea when you're going to get there. You might be sitting in the forest, staring into the night with tear-stained eyes, desperately wishing for light to come. You might have caught a glimpse of pre-dawn sunlight breaking over the horizon and then stopped yourself from hoping because what if the light never breaks through? If that's the case, I want to give you an anchor for your soul. We are anchored in hope. You and I can live this Christmas season anchored in hope for two basic reasons. First reason is because of what God has done in Christ. Through his resurrection, Jesus has defeated the power of sin and death, and we have a living hope. 1 Peter 1.3 says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And the second reason is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. When you choose to turn your life over to Jesus, he saves you and he places his spirit in you, the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit within you will remind you that you are God's kid. You're his kid. Romans 8, 16 says, The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. So with that reality, that Jesus has given us a new birth into a living hope and brought us into a new family as God's kids, you and I can live in the present age, this present with confidence and face the future with courage. Whatever you're facing, this is what you can know. Romans 5, 3 through 4. We can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials for we know that they help us develop endurance. And endurance develops strength of character and character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. And the Apostle Paul in his letter to the, first, to the Thessalonians, he he's remembers them. He says, remember them for their endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. 
So this hope, this hope of Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us, it's what the writer of Hebrews in chapter 6, 19 calls a sure and firm anchor of the soul. Here's my challenge for you. There's 28 days between now and Christmas. I want to encourage you to hold tightly to that anchor of hope. The whole bottom line of this message is this, that Christmas reminds us that Jesus fulfilled the hope of the world and fills us with hope for the world to come. He's our promised hope. Hope for a world waiting in darkness for a light to shine. Hope for your world, a hope that will never disappoint. And hope that he will return again to make everything new, wipe away every tear, and once and for all put an end to death, mourning, crying, and pain. Hebrews 6.19, I love the way Eugene Peterson paraphrases it in the message. He writes it this way. We who have run for our very lives to God have every reason to grab the promised hope with both hands and never let go. Grab the promised hope with both hands and never let go. Would you make this Christmas season one where you grab the promised hope with both hands and never let go? I'm going to have the worship team come on up, and this is what I want to invite you to do. Go ahead and stand with, with us. As we go into this final song of worship, I want, to, I want to give you an invitation, and I really believe this, that I think there's some people in the room where this is exactly why you're here this morning. This is the message that you needed to hear, and there's a physical response for you to take. It's a bold one, it's a risky one, but it looks like this. It looks like you stepping out of where you're seated, where you're standing now, and coming to the front and allowing the front of this room to be an altar where you can grab on to the promised hope of Jesus with both hands and not let go. There's things that you are navigating where hopelessness has been your reality. And you just heard a whole lot of scripture come at you to hopefully convince you that Jesus is your hope. And that this season, you can grab on to that promised hope with both hands and never let go. Because I'll tell you folks, that's what Jesus did for you. He grabbed on to you with both hands and he ain't letting go. He's your hope. He's your hope today, and he is your blessed hope because he is coming back. So as we worship, I just invite you to consider coming forward. You can get on your face, get on your knees, stand, whatever, but grab on to the promised hope that you have in Jesus. Thank you, God. Thank you for the promised hope in Jesus. Hope that showed up 2,000 years ago as tiny infant Jesus. But you grew up, Jesus. And it's through your death, your resurrection, that you have delivered us into a living hope. And there is a day that we will see where you come again as our blessed hope. And until that time, we have the assurance of hope. We can grab on with both hands and not let go. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's worship. Be
Church, there's our hope. God with us. So we are so looking forward to the rest of these Advent days to talk about the other portions of Advent. And if you need prayer, just come on up. We'll be we'll pray with you. Uh, but just remember, there's the church is open. So if you need one of us, just jump out and grab us. And we'll be glad to pray for you. So come on, Lord. I pray right now a special anointing over this church as they leave that they see the hope in you, Lord, because you're our hope. We can't grab onto the other things that are around us. We can only grab onto you. And we give you the praise and glory in your name. Amen. We love you, church. Have a great day.